Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Cross River Partnership's very first lunchtime launch session. I hope you're all keeping very well. I also hope that you have a tasty treat in front of you to eat while we're speaking. This session will be all about freight and how to distribute it in the best way possible across the central London boroughs. My name is Susanna Wilkes, Director here at Cross River Partnership, and over the next 45 minutes, we'll be sharing with you the results of our most recent research commissioned into freight and the provision of space for small distribution hubs within the central London subregion. Before we make a start, a few bits of housekeeping I would like to mention. This lunchtime launch session is being recorded and will be available to view online. Also, I know you'll be able to see that there's just one person watching this event. Please don't worry, you're definitely not alone in watching and I can assure you that there's a lot more than one person. If you do have any difficulties seeing or hearing during this lunchtime launch, please make sure you have joined us via the Google Chrome browser. We find this one definitely works the best. During today's lunchtime launch session, we'll be joined by a number of experts from across the industry. These include Barry Smith of Westminster City Council and the West End Partnership, Julie Bowerman of Consultant Steer, and Laura Jacklin of CRP. We'll also be joined We'll also be joined by CRP's Anusha Rajamani, who will be moderating the chat facility on the right of your screen. If you would like to expand the chat function at the bottom right hand corner, please press the arrows on the top right corner of the attendee and speaker lists to make them smaller. And last but not least, we have Rachel Aldridge leading all of our tech for the session. Thank goodness for that. So during today's lunchtime launch session, we will cover all of these topics on your screen and we will launch officially the CRP commissioned report into the role of urban logistics hubs in successful freight management. There will be a chance for you to have your questions answered at the end of all the presentations. We will try our very best to answer all of your pre-submitted questions, but if we're unable to, due to time constraints, we will respond to you after this live session. So before we make a start, we'd like to pose a question to you, the audience. How do you think freight could be managed differently across the central London boroughs to coordinate, to contribute, sorry, to contribute to a cleaner, greener and safer London as we emerge from COVID? If you could pop your thoughts in the chat box to the right of your screens, that would be greatly appreciated, giving your name and organisation too. So, in case any of you out there are new to Cross River Partnership, CRP was formed 27 years ago to build the Millennium Bridge across the River Thames. By now, CRP is delivering London's future together with partners including local authorities, business improvement districts, landowners and other strategic agencies. CRP's vision is to empower people to deliver innovative projects that support places to respond well to the challenges being thrust upon us. We've been working on freight issues for more than 10 years now, starting with the Freight Electric Trucks in Urban Europe programme that compared the feasibility of different electric truck sizes across different industry sectors. CRP is supported by a number of major funders who make all of our work, including this lunchtime launch series, possible. These include central government units DEFRA and Innovate UK's Challenge Fund, as well as the Mayor of London. 
These are just some of the projects that CRP is currently delivering with partners. The Central London Subregional Transport Partnership Group that you see there to the right brings together the senior transport officers from the 10 boroughs of Central London on behalf of Transport for London and facilitated by CRP. These boroughs meet every month to share best practice and lessons learnt, to coordinate activities across borough boundaries and to commission mutually useful studies, investigations and trials, all to help London. These have ranged from noise studies to sustainable street lighting to last mile cycling logistics to parking assessment frameworks. The latest is on urban logistics hubs, more on that in a minute. In order to show the strategic and proactive approaches being taken towards successful freight management at the very centre of London by Westminster City Council, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague Barry Smith, Head of Policy and Strategy for the West End Partnership. Uh, thank you very much, Susanna, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Susanna said, um, I will do a short presentation just setting the context talk a little bit about what Westminster have been doing around freight servicing and deliveries for the last two years or so, um, but particularly focusing on their recent work around urban logistic hubs. Um, just a bit of background to Westminster, and as you can see in the slide, very much um, caveated, caveated that this is pre-COVID-19. Um, the borough has a population of about 250,000, 50,000 businesses and 750,000 jobs. Um, as you can imagine, things are, are different currently, but we certainly hope to get back to something like that in the future. Um, given our central London location and those figures, I'm sure you'd appreciate that huge demands are placed on the city um, by the freight service and delivery sector. And indeed, the city places huge demands on the sector itself. Um, some key drivers for our work around freight have been the commitment by the city council to become carbon neutral by 2030. Um, and then the city to be carbon neutral by 2040. Um, and working with the mayor to eradicate all killed and seriously injured collisions by the mayor's target of 2041. Um, our thinking around freight is very much modelled on reducing the amount of vehicle trips, remoding what's left over, and retiming where appropriate in a managed way. And I think it's fair to say that urban logistics hubs have a crucial role to play in all of those things. Looking at the world, what we've learned over the last year or so in this very difficult year that we've gone through, there is already obviously some signs and some um, direction of travel coming out of, of COVID. Um, it's clearly accelerated trends that were already happening. We're all familiar with the um, increase in retail shifting online rather than bricks and mortar. The bricks and mortar left over means that currently there are obviously um, a fair number of vacant units. Um, that's obviously something that we are working with our private sector partners to uh, try and rectify. But there is an opportunity there around meanwhile uses in the short to medium term. And I think that's worth bearing in mind when we're thinking about this presentation. Um, there's certainly been a shift from business to business to business to customer. Um, and unsurprisingly, um, with the businesses furloughed, with lockdowns, as we all know, more people are ordering stuff at home that's um, resulted in more to home deliveries. And I think there's about a 60-40 split between that. And, and that's almost flipped over the last year. Um, we've also seen during the COVID and lockdowns, probably greater and more varied use of zero emission delivery services, such as e-cargo bikes. Um, and I think this has demonstrated that they have a role to play in business to customer, as well as business to business transactions. Um, over the last two years or so, as I mentioned, Westminster has um, been heavily involved in thinking about freight servicing deliveries. Um, this stretches back to May 2018 and part of the work that the West End Partnership led on, which was producing and commissioning an area-wide freight servicing and strategy for the West End, right up to December 20. And um, the topic that we're here to discuss today, the use of urban, uh, the potential for urban logistics, sandwiched between those two, are two um, studies that Westminster commissioned themselves. One in September 2020 was to look at building up an evidence base to try and understand better how freight servicing and deliveries worked in the city and their impacts on the city. Um, and then that led to um, late last year, 
the council um, putting forward and adopting um, a freight servicing and delivery strategy with a 20 year vision to take us up to that carbon neutral point in 2040. Um, Westminster's 20 year strategy that I mentioned, and I think this is relevant for setting the context of the work that we'll hear about later, has simplistically two key objectives. One, as I mentioned, is just to reduce the numbers and emissions of um, from vehicle movements associated with freight servicing and delivery and to work towards that KSI um, target by 2041. Those two objectives translate into the three targets below. Um, the apps and our proposed target in the strategy, and I will say very clearly and very upfront, this is a really ambitious stretch target. Um, and that is to reduce the absolute numbers of freight servicing and delivery vehicles by 80% over that's this 20 year period. Um, we estimate from our work on the evidence base that there's approximately 200,000 trips a day in Westminster associated with freight servicing and delivery. Um, and I think using the mayor's um, proxy of growth in, in, in vehicle numbers, um, if we don't do anything about reducing those numbers, over that 20 year period, they could go up by another 70,000. So we have set ourselves within the, the, the strategy, um, a very, very stretched target. The second one, as I said, um, under the reduce um, and remode is that all those trips that are left over will be zero emission by 2040, again, to help us meet our carbon targets. And then thirdly is the vision zero target that I alluded to earlier. So um, a bit of background to Westminster and freight servicing deliveries, in particular, and, and in focusing on the urban logistics side, <clears throat> we've been working very closely with DPD over the last 12 to 18 months. And this really came about through DPD opening up their first all electric parcel depot uh, on a site just around from St. James's Park Underground Station. That was a deal that was brokered by TfL, um, I think on TfL land, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, and DPD were the first, as far as I'm aware, of, certainly a very early operator to go public on what they wanted, um, a future vision, a future strategy, what they wanted, where they wanted it and what it would look like. And, and that certainly made it a lot easier for us to, to, to work with them. So following on the opening of DPD Westminster, um, uh, DPD Hyde Park, Park Lane Car Park has opened. And apologies, this has sort of got a number of names. It's referred to as Hyde Park Car Park, Park Lane Car Park, and in some cases, Marble Arch Car Park, but it's, it's all the same car park. Um, so we were able to facilitate discussions between Q Park and Q, Q, Q Park, who manage Westminster's car parks and DPD. Um, there was strong political support for this to happen, um, right up to leadership level. Uh, and also working with the DFT to make this happen as well. Um, and also a point that Susanna picked up earlier, very strong support from both the West End Partnership, but also our major landowners and West End bids. So we're really, really pleased that two of DPD's three micro depots in London are in Westminster, and, and those three are part of a total of eight depots that, that DPD would like citywide. And London wide, not Westminster city wide. Um, and just a map and some facts and figures around the two depots. So you'll see the location of those, the Westminster one on the left, Hyde Park on the right. You'll see that the Hyde Park um, space is, is almost twice as big as the Westminster one. And if you can read the slide on the capacity, the capacity for Hyde Park is about um, three times as much as that in Westminster. Um, the Westminster depot mostly serves the SW1 postcodes and the Hyde Park one covers all of the central West End W1, then WC2, uh, WC1 and WC2 postcodes. Um, and both um, Westminster handles about 1,000 a day and Hyde Park about 1,500 a day. I'm not sure if those figures have increased over the last six months to year with COVID, implications of COVID. So a little bit about Westminster background, a little bit about the work that we've been doing with DPD and their micro hubs. And then from me, just thinking about going forward, uh, and I would again reiterate the point for Westminster, there is a strong political will for more hubs uh, in the city and to work with more um, operators. We don't, we've enjoyed working with DPD, but we don't, um, we're very happy we're working with other operators and not just parcel operators, um, but others that may be interested in, in logistic hubs. 
we're very keen to think about how we might encourage and facilitate um, co-location of operators, um, both in co-location, but potentially the sharing of facilities on site, whether that is EV infrastructure, whether that is showers, lockers, off quasi office space, etc. cetera. Um, I mentioned our 20 year strategy um, that has an action within that that encourages the provision of hubs, not only with our own property portfolio, but within landowners, the private sector, but also our other public sector partners like the NHS, like central government and like TfL. Um, we're interested in exploring the use of logistic hubs, not only for the parcel sector, which is obviously a very key sector of the overall logistics industry. It's a growing sector, um, but it's not the only part of the wider um, uh, freight servicing and delivery sector. So ideas around um, is there potential for food and beverage um, consolidation and distribution, um, servicing, um, lockers for tools, etc., and something interesting, I think, potentially around construction um, deliveries. Um, the idea of a model spec for hubs, um, I think, is great, and it's something that we um, have supported and I think is really valuable for building into the planning process so that hubs of the nature that you'll hear more about through our next speaker can be provided on redevelopments or potentially refurbishments and therefore built into the planning and development process and opportunities. And overall, it's about working together, joining up our working, sharing our best practice and learning, uh, and doing that both at a borough level, but a sub-regional level through organisations like Cross River Partnership. And on that point, my um, presentation is finished, so I'd like to hand over to Julie Bowerman at STEER. Thank you, Barry. So I'm just going to give you a run through of the study that we completed to look at the potential for urban logistics hubs in central London. Right, so the study um, carried out a, a, a number of different research arms, including policy review, case studies, uh, discussions with operators, and also discussion with the boroughs. The study looked at two main areas. We looked at supply, looking at uh, the different sites that might be available for urban logistics hubs. And then we also looked at demand, uh, consulting with operators about what kind of features they would want to see and um, what the market might be. Just a couple of definitions here. Um, during the study, we, we came to the conclusion about that there were two types of uh, last mile delivery hubs. The first urban, logist urban logistics hub would be larger sites, which are operated generally by uh, suppliers with a, a longer supply chain, and maybe a national supply chain, and they deliver that last mile via electric vehicles. Then we've got micro hubs, which are much smaller sites that focus on local deliveries by foot or by bike. Here we show the timeline for the study. And as you can see, it within the context of COVID, there was a lot going on during the study period. And I think one thing I'm, I should say now is a big thank you to all those people who took part in this study over what was quite a challenging period. There's, those people who were involved, um, we worked with uh, the London boroughs that you can see here in green. So Southwark, Lambeth, Wandsworth, Westminster, Camden and the city. And they supported us in terms of providing site potential site operations, which Laura will talk about in a little while. And also providing, I suppose, a bit of local context in terms of the approach to urban logistics hubs. Our study started with a policy review and we found that there was strong support for urban logistics hubs across both national, regional, sub-regional and local level and the policies which I won't go into are all shown on that slide. The policy review identified that there were objectives which uh, the provision of local logistics hubs could support in delivering and these included a reduction in the number of delivery vehicles, uh, improvements to air quality, improvements to road safety. And that's not only considering the reduction in the number of vehicles on the network, but also the size of those vehicles, i.e. reducing the number of HGVs on the network, reduction in congestion, 
and then also supporting the boroughs in their efforts to achieve uh, net zero carbon emissions targets for 2050. The next part of the study, we looked at case studies within the UK and also internationally. There's a small selection shown here in terms of the images, which I'll quickly run through. So we looked at zero emission delivery fleets, such as EcoFleet, which is shown here. We also looked at some of the changes that had occurred in terms of operations. The, the picture here of the phone with Sainsbury's is the Sainsbury's Chop Chop service. So during COVID, the Sainsbury's looked to repurpose some of their underused stores to provide dark convenience stores, which delivered small shopping orders by bike to the local area. Then we've got the more traditional, perhaps, um, consolidation operations, such as that offered by Newt, who consolidates services and then do the onward delivery through electric vehicles. And finally, we looked at some of the larger consolidation operations, such as the SEVA contract with Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital, and they provide an off-site consolidation service which serves the entire estate. So what did these case studies show us? Well, the key benefits that they we were able to uh, identify from these studies included a reduced overall mileage, reduced amount of empty running. So therefore, the freight service is much more efficient. It indicated that there was a reduction in the distance travelled on the main road network. And not only was the reduction in, in the demand, but also a reduction in the AMP which is very important when considering congestion issues. There was also a reduction in the number of deliveries at the end user. So the end user was benefiting by having less parcel deliveries to, to process um, within their buildings. There's also a reduction in emissions and a reduction in business costs, which are largely achieved through fuel savings. And fuel is a, is a major cost within um, the uh, the logistics industry. So what we tried to collate some common areas of what of success, those things that made these, these operations successful. Well, clearly um, achieving a sufficient volume of deliveries to make the operation commercial is important. Um, also provide having a local policy and, and regulatory context, which is supportive. Being able to identify end users, businesses that would uh, would would be using the service, but also understanding their motivations. And that's considering whether or not they're looking for consolidation or perhaps they've got wider objectives in terms of uh, being carbon neutral. Um, the provision in a lot of these case studies of some pump priming funding or other contributions from the public sector was important. And um, in some instances, providing additional services such as uh, storage. The professionalism of the operation is key for, to making sure that those deliveries are delivered uh, in line with expectations and then promoting these services and getting people to better understand what a local delivery hub can offer. Thinking about some of the barriers, um, Finding suitable premises, and I think this is going to be a key theme of this presentation, finding suitable premises is a really is a really important um, point for operators. Every operator is looking for a, a site. In terms of the limitations, clearly there are limitations in terms of the distance that can be travelled, uh, in terms of batteries, but also in terms of what's reasonable for somebody to cycle a parcel across London. Some of the logistics systems aren't set up for these micro logistics systems for tracking parcels aren't set up for this these types of micro operation. And I suppose the converse from from the success factor is the barriers is the the difficulty in understanding the regulatory and and, uh, and policy framework across the different boroughs in London. The high cost of land and leases is also uh, a key barrier to success. So our next step was then to engage with the operators. Uh, we contacted 15 operators and eight agreed to be uh, interviewed as part of the process. The operators are there identified and they cover a range of uh, national, oops, national, sorry, delivery, and uh, and and local, uh, uh, more uh, smaller scale operations. In terms of the insights we gained, I think. Um, Operating this project across 
for the pandemic period did provide us with the opportunity to understand a bit more about the impacts of COVID and we were able to ask the operators about these. So COVID did have, uh, it's had a considerable impact on the freight business, I think as Barry had sort of mentioned. Uh, after an initial dip, dip in demand, there's been a sustained increase in requirements for delivery. Many of the operators are citing levels of activity similar to Black Friday or pre-Christmas over a sustained period. The change has also been from business to business to business to consumer, much more home deliveries, I think, as we're all aware. And the operators have also needed to adapt considerably to the new way of working, as we all are, in terms of uh, contactless deliveries, training drivers, but also understanding the fluctuations in the road network. Uh, there have been a number of initiatives to support social dis distancing, which have meant that some routes, for example, in the summer we had the help out to eat out and a number of roads being closed. So understanding how they can make deliveries local was, was uh, a, need, a need to adapt. Finally, many piped that they felt that the uh, COVID, uh, that COVID and, the, and the pandemic had actually accelerated an already ongoing trend, which is to much more retail home deliveries. Uh, and I think, as Barry mentioned, that leaves us with a question mark about what those commercial premises can be used for in the future. So moving away from um, the COVID implications, what we also tried to do was talk to the operators of logistics hubs and micro logistic hubs about what the key features of a hub would be for their operation. So within the report, which you'll see, we've identified space requirements, location requirements, access requirements, lease and contractual arrangements, security and, and anything else that um, might be required. In summary, there's much more information in the report, but in summary, um, the operators see that there is a significant increase in, and sustained increase in demand. I think we just mentioned that business to business had gone down, but home delivery had gone up. Many of them mentioned that once business to business comes back, they don't anticipate there will be a significant reduction in home delivery. So it, there is definitely a market for logistics hubs. Many of the operators are actively looking for sites. Operators are looking for sites which are adjacent to the road network. And I think it's also important to note that logistics hubs are not storage. In, goods come in at night and they leave in, in the morning. Therefore, the space requirements for a logistics hub are not perhaps as large as you might anticipate. So for example, an urban logistics hub, the slightly larger operation, could operate at say 3,000 square feet, whereas a micro consolidation site could operate at say 200 square feet. With the advent of electric vehicles and local authorities pushing more for electric delivery, there is a requirement for additional charging facilities. Other features um, are a need for security. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about the requirement for head height. Um, in the sites that we identified, a number of them, as Barry mentioned, were in were car parks, which have restricted head height. Clearly, the consolidation vehicle that brings in the consolidated goods is quite large and um, would probably need a head height of, say, three to four metres. Um, the it's worth noting that the vehicle does not need to enter the hub. So having a parking space next to the hub built into it would be appropriate. Many operators are happy to co-locate. Um, in terms of lease agreements, um, larger operators are looking for something um, a bit longer because they're obviously investing in the site. Whereas the smaller operators are looking for something that's more flexible and maybe that offers us some thoughts in terms of those meanwhile uses that we could put uh, the commercial spaces that have been left behind during the pandemic. Finally, all operators would like to see some financial support from central, local and transport bodies, but wouldn't be all. Um, this slide just provides you with an, over, an overview of the key requirements for small, medium and larger operators. There's much more, I I'm not proposing to go through this slide in any detail, uh, and there's much more information in the report. 
So that summarises very quickly uh, the report that we've completed. And I'd now like to hand over to Laura Jacqueline, who's going to talk about the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'm going to read through um, some of the outcomes of the report and I just want to say thank you again to all those that contributed um, under very pressurised times under a pandemic, um, trying to look at space and operators being able to have time to be interviewed and the great work that STEER have done um, on this study. So, as I said, I'm going to go through some of the work that was done on talking to local authorities, landowner, landowners, businesses and business improvement districts on space that was available and what potential logistic space could be. So as part of the study, there was a site identif identification guidance template sent out to all of the stakeholders as you can see and it was very detailed so we were asking um, all these stakeholders on site information of the site name, the address, the description, the ownership, any existing lease terms, the physical space so storage space, floor space, access space, power supply, on-site services in any facilities, managerial that was access to the site on the road network, wharves, piers, um, mainline rail network, any loading bays, any suitability for 24 hour operations. Financially, this was all looking at the cost per square meter, number of displaced car parking spaces. Commercially, it was looking at the demand for the services in that area and also some anticipated risks. So understanding if there were any risks for this space to be changed into a different usage. Now, all of this is in the report um, and there is a lot more detail in the report, which is now online as Anusha has just put um, the link to it. So please do have a look at it. We are just doing a bit of an overview for you now. So once this information and template went out to the respondents, to the local authorities, they were also then engaged um, with by the steer team to understand a little bit more about those sites and get more detail. So this isn't just a, this is the site name and the address. There was a lot of work um, understanding what these sites could be. And also proposing that it's not just the traditional warehouse um, site that would be looked at, you know, things like uh, railway arches or car parking spaces were also looked at. So I think this is what everyone's been waiting for. What what are the areas that were identified? So there were a total of 29 sites identified, as you can see on this map. It's also on the report. The ones in green are the ones that were identified during the study from different um, stakeholders. And the ones in red were the ones that we found during the case study um, work with operators. So these are ones that are already existing in the central area, either if they are uh, by cargo bike or by DPD, for example. So this kind of gives you a view of the central London um, space that there is available at the moment. These are potential sites as well. So from this, once the sites were identified, they were then ranked in um, whether they were good, poor, acceptable for the types of potential sites that they could be. And so this is yet again in the report and there is a, a table with all 29 sites and their kind of suitability towards being an urban logistics hub with you know, HGV access to micro logistics hubs where it is more cargo bike focused. We also put in the height restrictions as this is quite essential with any HGV access, the strategic access to any kind of the site. Um, and as you can see, some of the ones that are on here are underground car parks. Um, quite a few did come up and more underground car parks in, in quite a lot of the central areas that are underutilised at the moment and could be changed. And there were railway arches as well identified. After these 29 sites were identified, 11 were explored in more detail. So this is um, further down in the report when you are looking at it. And these are the ones where, as we said, underused garages, underground car parking, potential railway arches. And the, the, the point to pick out here is that there are sites that are for a local authority who is own ownership of it. And this is the type of criteria and extra detail that come from these sites. And all of these sites then have a cycle catchment area to showcase the last mile potential on cargo bike, but also the drive catchment area as well. So it really does impact not only the site that's been identified, but the local area. 
and the last mile that can be done from that. Uh, another example is um, a bid stakeholder looking at disused railway arches and how these potentially could be explored as a logistic space, maybe more um, a micro consolidation space, but there is there's still a different type of space to be used. And also a landowner as well. So it does really showcase the amount of stakeholders that were interviewed during this study to see how everyone could look at underutilized space um, for logistics. So after gathering all this information, there is now a clear template of criteria that could um, be used to look at any underutilised space across London um, and what that would mean. We also did ask about any kind of uh, policies for noise as well in those areas. So if there's any restrictions, if there's any residents. So the template of criteria is very detailed so that all details can be um, provided by those who own the land. And so the operator can, can make a sense of whether it is suitable for their operations or not. We are also looking to create an online tool, an interactive map to showcase these locations and the details that we can get from the criteria and the available spaces and engage with all the stakeholders across London and obviously the industry to see how underutilized space could be used um, for logistics in a sustainable way. What we have been working not just on um, this freight study, but there are lots of studies that the Celestial Group have been working on, as you can see on the website. So it's definitely worth having a look at some of the other studies that have been done on enabling last mile cycle logistics to also a report uh, recently done on noise monitoring for freight. So that will be coming out in February and that's looking at how uh, what is the noise impact of freight vehicles delivering in central London. And that, as I said, is all on the website. So um, please, you know, have a look, um, read it all and um, we'll go on to Q&A now. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Laura and Julie and Barry. Some extremely insightful presentations there. I hope you've all found them useful and that they've provided you with further knowledge on some of the freight initiatives that are being considered at the moment in London. I have got a number of questions that have been pre-submitted, so I'd like to e ask each of you one question, which I'm hoping you can answer in less than a minute. Um, so starting off with you, Barry, in terms of planning policy, can you tell us a tiny bit more about what role you think planning policy can take in promoting sustainable freight? Uh, thanks, um, Susanna, and I'll try and be as quick as uh, the one minute that you've asked for. Um, I think it's really important and planning policy has a, a pretty crucial role in this both in terms, I think, first off, of protecting land that could be used for freight and logistics use, and then encouraging the reprovision of that land or the reprovision of facilities like the urban hubs we've been talking about through the planning process. Um, so from a London perspective, there are several policies in the London plan that are really helpful if you want to sort of pursue this at a, at a borough level. Um, policies E4, 5 and 7, E4, 5 and 7 in the employment aspect will talk about provision of, of industrial logistics land and last mile is particularly mentioned in those. Um, transport policy, policy T7 um, also mentions about freight servicing's contribution and consolidation. From a Westminster perspective, we've got um, two policies, policy two and policy 30, both encourage um, last mile deliveries and um, urban logistics hubs micro distribution. Um, and then I think if you haven't got a policy as a, a local authority in your plan, by all means, as I say, use the London plan or indeed um, a strategy um, or a supplementary planning document or guidance note can, can provide those hooks to enable you to negotiate um, the provision of these um, in, in the borough going forward. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Barry. Julie, could I turn to you now and ask that given there will be enormous financial pressure on companies to cut costs at the moment, how do we persuade them to invest in a sustainable future? Thank you, Susanna. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, obviously, the, there are challenges at the moment. We are currently working with an operator who's got a, an old, older building, which has got a very large loading dock on the on the ground floor. And 
they are looking at uh, repurposing that ground floor and looking at the business case of actually using a micro consolidation center to deliver to to their business instead of having the loading dock on their site and they think that the business case for that will stack up so i think that's one point i think the second point i would make is that the within the report we've identified a number of wider benefits um for urban logistics hubs and those go to the heart really i think of of businesses social corporate responsibilities um and there is much more pressure, I think, in terms of delivering finance to support um, a range of investments from I think, people like pension funds to demonstrate the credentials of those of those of, of those businesses about how they are actually achieving um, carbon redu reductions, etc. And I think that from this report, you can see that there are significant benefits in terms of air quality, safety. And um, and in terms of uh, reduced mileage, etc., which all go go to support that. So I think I would point to those two those two areas. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Julie. Turning to you now, Laura. Can you tell us what are the specifications for the different freight hubs, so that landowners and others can try to identify sites, and also how will those with potential sites and companies that might like to use them actually be connected? Yes. Yeah, so um, I think in the slides we, we went into kind of the specifications of different types of hubs, and and we hope the report can delve into that deeper which it has and, and I think it's definitely looking at all of the different aspects of a hub whether that's the space the dimensions what are the restrictions of access is there any kind of policies that 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 happen there so so we definitely have a look at the report and then um identifying them and then getting them connected with the right companies that would like to um operate from them that's just the next step as I said uh, we we are looking to connect people with the right contacts from those who have identified to, identified the sites to those who are interested in using them so um, we're trying to keep up a updated directory of all those um, and and help people find the, the right space for them. Brilliant. Thank you, Laura. Um, great comments from everyone. Thank you for all of the comments that have come in from you, the audience. We will be sending a follow up email tomorrow, which will have all of the slides, links to the report again, press releases and answers to all of your questions, um, because we're not going to have enough time to go through them all now. We could be here all afternoon. So, um, in terms of the next lunchtime launch session that CRP will be running, it'll be on Thursday, the 25th of February at 1.15, and the topic will be making monitoring meaningful. So please do sign up. Also, if you do have any questions that you would like to get in touch with individual speakers from today, please do contact them via these email addresses that are showing on your screens. We'd like to say a huge thank you to all of you for taking part. I'm not sure if there have been some technical difficulties with sound, but we'll definitely be sending around the slides, the report and all links tomorrow. Um, I would like to especially thank our speakers today for some really thought provoking information. Very big thank you to all of you for tuning in. Do stay safe and see you all again very soon. Goodbye.